Welcome everyone to the Ideas 42 Academy seminar series. My name is Mitra Salalasel and I'm the Director of Communications at Ideas 42. On behalf of all of us on the team, thank you for tuning in to learn more about applying behavioral science to, social, to tough social problems. Uh, today, we're joined by Elizabeth Linos. She is an Assistant Professor of Public Policy and the founder of the People Lab at the University of California at Berkeley to provide an overview of her work increasing safety net program uptake through stigma reduction. Before I hand it off to Elizabeth, just a small housekeeping matter for those of you who may be new to our seminar series format. Uh, we'll be taking questions through the Zoom uh, Q&A box at the end of the presentation, and we've got enough time built in at the end of the hour uh, to accommodate several questions. Um, but as you have them, go ahead and uh, drop them into the Q&A box and we'll answer them live all at once. Um, and you can find that box at the bottom of your screen. Um, all right, without further ado, Elizabeth, over to you. Thank you so much, Mitra, and thank you um, to you and Moises and the whole Ideas42 team for, for inviting me um, to share this work. I'm really excited to talk to you about it because it's new work, um, and so there's a lot of room for kind of feedback and adjustments, so uh, excited to, to share. Most of the things that I'm going to be talking about today are, are co-authored with Jessica Lasky-Fink, um, who is a PhD student uh, at uh, the Goldman School of Public Policy. If you don't know her already, uh, you should. Um, so. Uh, feel free to reach out to either her or me after this presentation. So just to get us started, um, I wanna tell you a little bit about the People Lab uh, because this is the kind of uh, infrastructure through which we do these projects. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you about this afterwards in Q&A as well. Uh, the People Lab is a, a research team uh, at UC Berkeley. Um, and our goal is really to transform the public sector by producing cutting edge research on the people in government and the communities they serve. And so all of the projects that we do are collaborations with governments and other stakeholders to either strengthen the government workforce, improve public service delivery, or foster engaged communities. And the work that I'm going to present today um, is in that second bucket of how do we think about improving public service delivery. In that space, and, and this is not going to be new uh, to most of you, we've been thinking a lot about um, the social safety net and broadly means tested programs. Uh, there's a huge literature uh, that I won't go through today that talks about um, how important that social safety net is in terms of long-term outcomes uh, for low-income households across the U.S. Um, but we know that, you know, depending on what program you look at, somewhere between 20 and 50 percent of low-income households um, are not um, getting uh, the programs that they're eligible for. They're not accessing them or they're not uh, taking them up. And so one of the big challenges that, that we're thinking about a lot at the People Lab and others are too, is you know, what are the ways that we can um, improve the delivery of mean tested programs so that we reduce the barriers that people face? Um, in my work uh, as a public management scholar, I lean a lot on kind of the administrative burdens framework, which we'll come back to. But the insight is uh, uh, pretty clear. So basically, anytime that you are interacting with your government, um, to get access to a program, you may face informational burdens and barriers. So you have to figure out that the program exists. You need to figure out the eligibility requirements and those kind of learning costs or information costs are real. Um, then there's a host of logistical or compliance burdens that people face. Things like having to find the right documents or showing up to an interview. And all of those compliance burdens also um, are barriers for take up. But the area that we're focusing on now is actually um, an area that is cited, but not often studied, which is the psychological barriers um, that people face uh, when they think about whether or not they're going to access a program for which they're eligible. And stigma um, is a huge part of that literature. We have a lot of qualitative evidence um, that uh, stigma might play a role, but we haven't really studied it empirically in the same way that we have um, for some of the other types of burdens. So here's my kind of very quick summary of where I think the literature is. Uh, feel free to debate me on this. Um, you know, we've been thinking about this across a host of different disciplines, whether it's in psychology or economics or public management. Um, but overall, the evidence I think is relatively mixed about how we can use behavioral science tools uh, to reduce those administrative barriers. So here's my summary. And again, this is somewhat controversial, so, so feel free to disagree. My sense is that we're, we have pretty good evidence about how we can nudge initial engagement by potential um, eligible low-income households. We know how to send them information in different ways. We know how to increase click-through rates to websites. 
we know how um, we can get people to read the information, or at least we have kind of a growing body of evidence around that first stage in kind of a longer compliance process. Um, so think about EITC, financial aid, SNAP enrollment. Um, we have some evidence um, that you can improve outcomes if you reduce compliance hurdles. So going back to kind of early work on the FAFSA, um, Bettinger 2004, all the way to some of the work that uh, is more recent around assistance um, for SNAP enrollment, we have evidence that if you can reduce compliance hurdles, you actually do increase um, take up. But as I mentioned, we know very little, um, not only about the relative importance of stigma in people's decision making, um, but even less so about how to actually reduce stigma of social programs. So that's really where um, our work begins. So let me tell you a little bit about the context that I'm going to talk about today. We could have worked on other programs, but in this case, we're focusing on, on uh, rental assistance. As you know, during COVID, uh, one of the big challenges that many local governments faced was um, that money was pouring in from the federal government to support people who were at risk of losing their homes, at risk of eviction or displacement. Um, but there was a real challenge that the money wasn't kind of getting out the door fast enough. So a huge housing crisis um, has already emerged, was bubbling. Money was not the problem. Resources were coming through the door. But for some reason, there was a barrier at that final stage, that last mile, where families were not accessing uh, the money that was uh, earmarked to support uh, temporary rental assistance, utility payment assistance, and all sorts of kind of eviction-related programs. And when we think about this with a kind of an administrative burden framework, uh, which is uh, where we started, you can imagine a bunch of different reasons why this is the case. So, um, you know, on the information and learning cost side, you know, this is a new, a newly expanded program. For many families, this was the first time um, that they struggled with housing and rental assistance. And so it's also a population that um, may not have kind of the experience of how to navigate government systems, which you know adds a lot of learning cost to the process. Um, on the compliance side, and this has changed throughout the pandemic, but for some um, locations, you needed landlord approval to get rental assistance, you needed to provide documentation to show that it was because of COVID that you needed rental assistance. Some of that has been um, significantly simplified now, thank goodness, but you can imagine that's part of the challenge. Um, and then the part that we are focusing on is also the kind of psychological stigma for a newly eligible population that has to admit to themselves and to others that they might need help. And so in the literature uh, on mental health, uh, or on uh, kind of physical health. There are many studies that talk about societal or public stigma and how that affects behavior. Um, there's also really interesting research on anticipated stigma. We're gonna come back to these ideas, but essentially this is the idea that I worry that I will be judged or I worry that other people will look down on me if I participate in this program. And of course there's internalized stigma, the, the shame uh, or, or sense of failure that people face or feel if they feel like you know, I wasn't the kind of person who needed assistance and now I do need assistance. Um, so all of those factors could play a really important role in why people were not taking up uh, rental assistance. So I'm gonna quickly go to the studies so that we can have time for questions. Uh, we've now done this in multiple places. The first study that I'm gonna present um, is kind of the simplest version. We worked uh, with a fantastic team in Austin to change how they were framing or talking about um, the assistance that they were offering. And again, I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly, but we can come back to it with questions. So they had a population that they were going to email anyway to tell them about rental assistance. This is kind of the, the email um, uh, that uh, went out. And it basically says, look, are you struggling to pay rent? You're not alone. Here's this rent program. It's helped lots of people in Austin, apply now. So for the behavioral scientists in the room, you can see kind of a very clear um, description of the information with simplified terms. You know, we, we help them a lot with, with the design of this um, kind of information sharing. And you have a really clear outcome at the end, which is, um, do people apply? Do people click on that link for, uh, to engage with the process? We wanted to test this kind of information-based um, outreach, which is really trying to cover the learning costs or the informational barriers that people face against a really similar email 
that um, slightly tweak the language to try to destigmatize it. And I should say, you know, the first version, this information only um, email uh, isn't particularly stigmatizing, but you'll see slight variations between, you know, saying you're not alone and saying you're not alone and it's not your fault because of COVID, many Austinites need a little extra help right now. So we're trying to kind of shift the burden or the shame that people might feel away from um, their sense of identity, that it's their fault, that they've done something wrong to say that, look, it's really just about COVID. Um, the other part that we wanted to focus on is this idea of anticipated stigma. If one of the reasons people um, don't participate is because they, they worry that uh, someone's going to judge them on the other side, we wanted to emphasize that the person on the other side of this interaction, the government person who's, who's reading these applications, really wants all people to get the money. They're not there to judge or pick who is most worthy or deserving. They want all qualified applicants to get the assistance they deserve, um, as opposed to saying kind of, we're here to, um, to triage who is most worthy. Um, so it's kind of really, really simple, obviously zero cost intervention, both because it's an email um, and because the language changes are really small. Um, and what we see is just with this kind of slight adjustment in, in language, um, we see a 30% increase in click-throughs. So we see kind of engagement numbers on the initial email that are uh, pretty standard for this type of communication, just by adjusting the language a little bit to remove some of that stigma, um, we see a huge increase. Now, uh, uh, as I said before, we've reached a point in kind of behavioral science and public policy where we shouldn't be stopping at click-through rates. Um, and I'm happy to talk about this uh, later, but once you see uh, kind of studies like this where we can talk about engagement or click-throughs, the next question you should be asking is, okay, but does that even lead to anything? Does that lead to anything substantive on the policy side? So to answer that question, um, we did a study in, in Denver with their housing stability office that is gonna look very similar in terms of setup, but I'll show you the results all the way through um, to, to kind of the final outcomes that we care about. So in Denver, um, one of the main challenges uh, that Denver faced is that they had to first figure out who to communicate with. So rather than having kind of an easy access email list like Austin, the first stage of our kind of collaboration with Denver said, okay, of the full 144 census tracts, where can we um, kind of start to place our, our emphasis so that we can send people in this case, postcards to their home to tell them about the rental assistance program. So these are people that, you know, it's not very well targeted. We don't know who they are. We just wanna send information to people's homes. So to do that, um, we use data from the Urban Institute and the Eviction Lab and Denver itself to pinpoint 56 at-risk neighborhoods where we thought um, we would have the largest kind of chance of reaching people who might be at risk of either displacement um, or eviction that ends up um, giving us a list of about 62,000 renters who are gonna be the population that we're gonna try to uh, do outreach to. So this is people who we think are renting their, um, uh, their homes in 56 neighborhoods, and we're gonna try to send them information about rental assistance or emergency rental assistance um, uh, as the case may be. So here's what we did. Um, we sent them postcards. Uh, we can talk all day about uh, the formatting of these postcards. I'm happy to answer questions about that. This is the front, this is the back, um, and you'll see some similar language, which I'm gonna get to in a second, but basically you get a kind of ugly postcard in the mail that says, are you struggling to pay rent? Um, here's what you have to do to check your eligibility and request an application. You can call a number, you can go online. Um, we have it in both English and Spanish. And um, this program is actually delivered through um, community-based organizations. So you'll see their logos um, at the top. On the behavioral science side, um, this is what it actually looks like in terms of language differences. We have um, information only uh, condition, which is what you, what you see here. The information plus kind of destigmatizing condition adjust language that looks quite similar to what I just showed you. So rather than saying, you're not alone, we say you're not alone and it's not your fault because of COVID-19, many Denver residents need a little extra help right now. In this case, you actually had to call to check your eligibility. In the original form of the postcard, we said, you know, call this number and a staff member will determine if you're eligible. To remove some of that anticipated stigma, we said, 
in the kind of second treatment, call this number and a staff member will help you determine if you're eligible. So rather than kind of the, the onus being on uh, the government worker to decide if you're worthy, we, we're now kind of thinking of the government worker as someone who supports you and making decisions that work for, for you. And again, we're really trying to emphasize this idea that we're here to help every eligible household get the assistance they deserve, um, rather than saying, you know, we can help many eligible households in need. So these are postcards. I showed you what they look like um, before, but these are kind of the slight tweaks in language. Um, and uh, hopefully I don't need to go into these details, but you know, we designed this as a randomized control trial. We have uh, 62,000 renters, we have three treatments. Um, we did have a control group that didn't receive any postcard. Um, this group still received all the kind of business as usual communications um, uh, that both the CBOs, the community-based organizations provided and the city of Denver, but we um, kind of maximize our impact uh, by focusing on as many postcards as possible. So the budget is the constraint in this case for how many postcards we could send. And we've split up the people who receive postcards between those that receive the information only postcard that I showed you and kind of the adjusted postcard that destigmatizes some of the language. 40% um, uh, uh, of the sample got that second, second postcard. And we were gonna measure a bunch of different um, outcomes. In this case, we don't have click-through rates because it's not online. Um, but we looked at the first um, step in the process, which was requesting applications. This is what the postcard asks you to do, right? So uh, the postcard says you can request an application by going online or calling this number. We then wanted to see whether that impacts whether applications were submitted. That has two components to it. Both it means, you know, you went through the extra hassle of getting your documentation to submit your application. It also allows us to check um, whether we were getting the right people. So imagine that a lot of people requested applications, but they were the wrong people, people who weren't actually eligible. We would see a, um, you know, a, a drop off at submitted applications. Um, we also uh, go further to look at um, assistance received, so actual you know, funds going out the door. And in our pre-analysis plan, we also were planning on um, looking at evictions. Um, the good news for the world is that the eviction moratorium continued. That was not the, you know, the plan when we started this project. Uh, the bad news is that because of the eviction moratorium, we can't look at effects on evictions. But to me, that's a, that's a small price to pay, um, given how important that eviction moratorium has been to so many families. So essentially, we're looking at kind of whether or not we see equality um, across all of these outcomes in, in the three groups. So I'm going to jump straight to results. Um, first, let's look at applications requested. Um, what we see, and it's pretty uh, impressive, is that in most cases, you know, postcards do better than nothing, uh, which, you know, phew, that's good. That's what we would expect as behavioral scientists. But across the board, we see these really kind of um, striking uh, improvements just by tweaking the language around stigma. So this is kind of a 70%, 77% increase in the number of applications requested between the control group and, and this destigmatizing postcard. Amazingly, that pattern holds for other types of outcomes down the line. So this is the main one, right? This is, you know, did you, uh, did you apply? Uh, when we look at submitted applications, again, we see almost a 40% increase in the number of people who submitted their applications if they got the destigmatizing postcard compared to the control group. And I'll just share one more outcome because I think it's really fascinating as we think about the role of behavioral science in a lot of these um, types of programs. We were interested in also thinking through how um, who applies might be affected by stigma. And what we find um, is that we see a huge increase in the kind of demographic composition of who applies. So in the control group, um, about 5% of applicants uh, were uh, coming from black households. And then you see this huge jump um, in the proportion of applications that come from black households when you look at information only or information and stigma. Um, you know, going from only 5% of applications to more than um, a quarter of applications being from black households. We see similar patterns, but not as extreme for Hispanic households. Um, but this is kind of a really fascinating um, insight that I, I really wanna explore further, which is that we see this six-fold increase 
in the proportion of black households when you kind of destigmatize a program. And I think that says a lot about how racialized um, uh, and, and gendered uh, welfare stigma is or social safety uh, net stigma is in the US today. And we can come back to that um, if that is of interest to you. I'm just looking at time. Um, let me give you just one more study for those of you who uh, are thinking about this from a social psychology perspective or uh, just kind of a research perspective. We did wanna confirm that the mechanism is what we think it is, um, that it's not some other part of the postcard that has really shown this, these effects in the real world. So uh, as one does, we turn to MTurk uh, to run an online study to say, okay, are we getting, are we really getting at a mechanism on stigma here? Or is it something else that's going on that we're not capturing? So um, we ran a few of these studies. Uh, one study um, that I'm gonna present today focuses on low income MTurker. So these are people who um, are as close as we can get to the population that we were trying to serve with this program. So people who make less than $50,000 a year in income, with about 600 um, or so people. And um, we're gonna show them the, the postcards or the language that I showed you before. And we're gonna ask them a bunch of questions, both about internalized stigma and about anticipated stigma. So I'm not gonna read through all of these, but essentially internalized stigma is asking them about their own personal kind of shame. Like I would be ashamed to apply for these programs. I would think less of myself. Anticipated stigma is about, you know, whatever I feel about myself and my own identity, maybe I worry that other people will look down on me or other people will judge me. And we really wanted to tease these things apart, um, partly because when there's so much pervasive societal stigma as, as there is with rental assistance, um, it's kind of shocking that we can get anything to move uh, when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to stigma that, that people are experiencing. But what we find uh, is essentially both move in the same direction, um, but we see kind of more significant um, and larger effects on internalized stigma. So to translate what this means, receiving that postcard um, may not have changed people's perceptions of the rest of the world or perceptions of, of kind of how they will be treated by the rest of the world as much, um, but seems to have significantly affected the, the internalized shame that people would feel, um, which is good news because that was a really big part of our intervention saying, you know, this is not your fault. Uh, and that's really where we see the biggest shift. Um, and one thing that I'll just put out here because um, it's really striking when you do these types of uh, research projects to just hear from people who, um, would be most affected. In this case, we received a lot of kind of open text responses about rental assistance. Um, and you do see both internalized stigma and anticipated stigma coming out in people's responses. Um, so one person says, I do feel inferior each time that I have to seek utility payment assistance. I know that it's important to ask for the help, but it still makes me feel bad. Uh, and then this other, I think, really interesting response that says, it would be hard for anyone to judge me for getting assistance because if I did apply for such a program, I would not broadcast it. So even though this person is saying they wouldn't judge me, the reason is because I wouldn't tell anyone. So that's just kind of a really interesting perspective, um, especially when we think that this is not just kind of broad social safety net needs, this is crisis emergency rental assistance when the whole world is basically um, struggling at the same time. So even in uh, an environment where, you know, the very nature of the crisis is hopefully temporary, um, there's still a lot of stigma associated with needing assistance. So um, I'll close soon to, to leave time for questions, but I wanted to give you a sense of kind of what's on the horizon with our work at the People Lab, just in case this is of interest to you. So one thing that you'll note um, in the work that I just presented, but also in other work that has been done in this space um, is that we can get a lot of kind of differences between treatment groups or messaging, but at the end of the day, um, it's really hard to find the people that uh, need to hear that message if you don't already have access to them. Um, so in some previous work that we've done on the earned income tax credit, um, one of the big challenges is, you know, how do you engage with people who are not already filing their taxes um, so that you can give them all the messages that tell them to, you know, go file their taxes. Like the government doesn't always have a tool um, to find those people to be able to do kind of targeted messaging. With the child tax credit, um, through a collaboration with the California Policy Lab, we are doing a project right now that kind of combines our best guess at behavioral messaging with uh, pretty good targeting. So kind of linking administrative data sets across government agencies 
to try to find people that should be receiving the child tax credit, but are not because they don't file taxes because they don't have to file taxes. So, you know, uh, cross your fingers. Uh, I'll be really curious to see uh, at the end of this work, whether good targeting plus behavioral messaging can kind of increase the overall impact of these types of projects um, on a really kind of substantive scale. In housing, um, the work that we're kind of pushing forward now is thinking about all the other players um, that contribute to housing policy in the US and thinking about stigma, not just of the individual potential beneficiary, but of those other players. So as many of you know, um, some of the largest programs that we have to support housing are housing choice voucher programs. Um, those programs depend on landlords allowing uh, tenants with a housing choice voucher uh, to rent out their property. And there's a lot of research that suggests that um, landlords um, don't always want housing choice voucher holders in their apartments. Um, so we're trying to figure out exactly how we can reduce the stigma that they uh, see in tenants and whether or not that's gonna affect supply of housing, not just demand um, for housing. So that's on the horizon. But ultimately, you know, as we think about this broader um, research agenda around administrative barriers, about kind of the broader social safety net, you know, one thing that I'm thinking about a lot is, is, you know, what is the role of behavioral science and what is and isn't possible with light touch interventions, um, just so that we move beyond kind of small tweaks to language, which I think are critical, if we can get, you know, a, a, a low cost intervention to have disproportionately large impact, I think that's fantastic news, but really try to think about how we can use kind of higher touch interventions or build in behavioral science insights into things like compliance hurdles or actual kind of, um, uh, documentation challenges that people face. So that's certainly um, an area that I'm thinking about a lot and, and something that I'd love your, your thoughts on as well. So I'll stop there. I put my um, Twitter handle and my uh, lab's website on here, um, but I know Mitra will be sharing my email address um, if, you, if you have other questions that we don't get to today. Great, <clears throat> great. thank you so much. Um, for walking us through that, Elizabeth. Um, and you know, a reminder to everyone um, in the audience, um, go ahead and drop some questions into the Q&A box. Uh, we do have two to get us started. Um, the first two are from Anthony Barrows, um, who actually leads uh, the economic justice work at Ideas42. Um, first question, how are you engaging affected communities in shaping the interventions you're impl implementing apart from MTurk feedback? Absolutely, it's such a good question. Um, and one thing that um, the people have in general is really committed to, and it's actually, that's why it's kind of a, the third vertical of our work is how to engage the communities that are most affected. So we're doing that in a bunch of different ways um, across our projects. Um, for example, one area that I'm really excited about in, in our public safety work is to say, okay, how do we um, select success metrics for our RCTs or whatever like fun intervention we do um, that map uh, much more closely to what the communities that are most affected would consider success. So in public safety, that means um, running, you know, a series of, of focus groups with various communities that are um, most likely to be affected by policing and asking them, like, what does, what does it feel like to be, to feel safe? What does safety look like to you? And then use those metrics as success outcomes for RCT. So we're doing um, a large collaboration now with the Everyday Peace Indicators that actually does that kind of work. For um, projects that are kind of uh, at this scale where we don't have that level of in-depth engagement, um, what we try to do in all our work is have at least some time before we design a project where we're directly speaking either to the potential um, users uh, of the service and kind of the leaders um, in this space that are not behavioral scientists or not researchers that really know and represent um, kind of broader communities. So for the work that I showed you in Denver, those, you know, those community-based organizations have so much expertise and so much insight um, that they shared that you know, any of these interventions are co-designed um, with, with those CBOs, uh, as the case may be, because it's, you know, it's also their name on it. So uh, it, would be, it would be bizarre if they weren't involved. But I actually think it's really helpful to, to think about that um, 
you know, that, that uh, expertise becoming central to how we think about designing public policy. Um, in the work that I just mentioned on, on landlords, um, you know, we're, we're, we're doing kind of the old school, we're, we're interviewing, we're doing qualitative interviews of potential landlords and trying to understand what barriers they face and what challenges they see and then incorporating that into our design. Um, but one area that I do wanna emphasize because maybe this, this feels different, um, and maybe it doesn't actually for this crowd, but in other crowds, um, is that there's also a ton of expertise in government on the front line. And so when we think about who we're engaging, um, of course, we should be engaging the people that are most impacted by these policies. But one group that is often underutilized in terms of their expertise are the frontline workers themselves. Um, and so one thing that I really want to emphasize in all the work that we do at the People Lab is that um, if it doesn't work for the frontline workers who have to deliver it, if it doesn't work for the government agencies, then it's not a good idea. I mean, ultimately, I don't, I don't see a benefit in kind of designing something that um, the people who would be involved in either implementing it or receiving kind of that outreach uh, wouldn't want to scale up. Great. Great. Um, okay. Second question um, is, how are you thinking about reducing stigma outside of COVID related programs? Yeah, it's such a good question. Um, so we've done some studies to try to understand what is and isn't as stigmatized in the kind of social safety net space. Um, and the results are exactly what you would expect. So um, rental assistance, even outside of the COVID environment is incredibly stigmatized. The only things that were more stigmatized are, are obesity and mental health issues, uh, which are like most of the research on stigma is actually coming from either mental health research or obesity research. Um, SNAP, so food assistance is up there um, also in terms of stigma, but things like the earned income tax credit are much less stigmatized. So one thing that we're thinking about now is, you know, where does that leave programs like the child tax credit? Like, is it, is it the case that um, those programs are not going to be particularly stigmatized in the future? Um, I don't know the answer, but we're certainly studying it now. Um, my sense of kind of where this could go next is to really think about um, interactions with government uh, frontline workers that could be stigmatizing. So anytime you have to go in and prove that you are poor or that you need the help or that you have to go interview to show that you need assistance, like those interactions are potential areas for a lot of stigma to play a role on both sides. And so I'm really excited to kind of think more about what those um, what those kind of interactions look like across the board, whether it's TANF or, or uh, SNAP, um, uh, food assistance of other forms at the local level, as well as, as, well as housing. Thank you. Um, so uh, we have a question from uh, Shannon um, and it's specifically on child tax credit communication. Um, so for child tax credit communication, what do you think about using the expiration of the benefit as a natural deadline to encourage filing? Yeah, so I mean, most of us are gonna be behavioral scientists in this room. So I think my expectation is that using deadlines um, helps, right? Um, but one thing that I think is important for us to think through is like what type of underlying psychological mechanism does the mm -hmm. deadline help on? So my sense, um, but we can disagree about this, is that you know creating the urgency of a deadline helps if we think the problem is procrastination or that other things come up. So that's that's certainly going to be the case for like getting your flu shot in a regular year, not this year, or you know filling out a form um, that is not like you you don't feel kind of psychologically ashamed to do it. You just have other things to do with your day. Um, I think there might be other types of barriers that a deadline um, exacerbates. Um, you know, if we're kind of thinking about the scarcity literature and thinking about cognitive load, adding in a very rigid deadline could um, discourage some subset of the population. But I do think in the case of the child tax credit, you know, thinking through what this is going to look like for non-filers is, is just, we're all working on it. You know, we're going to know in two years, but I don't know that we have good answers yet. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> I <know. laughs> um, so we've got a question from Ali. Um, have you looked at how program faming, pro, excuse me, program framing affects stigma 
um, e.g. food stamps versus SNAP as an example? Yeah, so, um, you know, I said at the front that we don't have a lot of evidence on stigma and social safety net. The one area, there's this one paper by, by Schassenbach, which I love, um, that looks at exactly that. My sense, um, so that paper basically looks at initial engagement. So we don't know yet if that makes a difference for kind of outcomes like, uh, you know, actually getting assistance, staying on assistance, et cetera. But I think framing your broader question, which is um, how do we think about framing these programs to remove some of that stigma is exactly, you know, how we're thinking about this. Um, the, the kind of ERA, the emergency rental assistance gives us an opportunity because it's not uh, because it was a new program and a relatively new eligible population to shape some of how we talk about it more than um, a program like SNAP, where there's a history, like there's a huge history of stigmatization that it's, mu it's much harder to change some of those um, uh, frames in the short term. But certainly in SNAP, there's been a lot of progress on this, whether it's what we call it or EBT cards instead of actual food stamps, like there's been a lot of movement trying to destigmatize um, food assistance in different ways. And I think that's, that's the only area really where we have um, any serious attempts at thinking about the psychological barriers. Thank you. Um, we have, have a question um, from an anonymous attendee. Um, why did you assume um, that those who requested an application but did not apply were not eligible? Are there other plausible explanations for people falling off between these stages? Oh, absolutely. And I, I, I misspoke if, if that's what I said. So I certainly didn't don't assume that everybody who kind of requested an application and then didn't submit the application was just people who weren't eligible. There's a host of informational compliance and psychological reasons why we, we would expect a drop off there. Um, so for example, you actually have to fill in forms, the landlord has to get involved, so it becomes much more difficult. Um, those are all plausible explanations. What I meant to say is, and this is true for a lot of my projects, there's a world in which we use our best guess messaging to get people through the door, but we're not getting any more people who would ultimately make it through whatever the, you know, whatever the rest of the process is. So in like, I do a lot of recruitment trials, like we can get everybody to apply, but if they're the kinds of people who aren't gonna be ever selected, then we've just wasted everybody's time. Similarly, in this case, if I got a bunch of people who were not eligible because they liked my messaging and then it flipped um, on submitting of applications, then I think we'd have to question whether that was a good strategy, but it's certainly the case that we would expect some drop off at each stage in the process. And you can imagine other studies that focus on that drop off, that focus on like amongst the people who submit, how do we get, or who request, excuse me, how do we get most of them to actually submit if they're eligible? Uh, um, returning to the child tax credit, we have a question from Brendan Babb. Um, has there been research on saying a service like preparing taxes for the child tax credit costs $100, but the person has been selected to receive a $100 credit that pays for it? Um, and the thinking behind this is about like stigma if something is free versus cost X, but is rebated or credited that same amount. Yeah. Um, so Brendan, I haven't seen that specific study, but I love it. And I'm like taking notes on the next round of the CTC studies. Um, there's a lot to unpack in what you suggested. So one is, um, do people value things that are free less? Um, and I think the jury is actually out on that. Um, so the best research that I've seen on that comes from development where um, there was a similar conversation about mosquito bed nets, which is a totally different context, where there was this debate about, you know, should we give everyone um, bed nets for free, but maybe then they won't value them. And, and I think the, the evidence there suggests that we were over, um, we were overly cautious that people wouldn't like things that are free or that wouldn't use things or value things that are free. But there's a second challenge with the child tax credit that I face in a lot of my work, especially in the earned income tax credit, is that it's creepy and weird for the government to tell you that you're just getting money and that you don't have to do anything for it. People think of that as spam. Um, or some sort of scammer to, you know, when, if you text someone and you say like, hey neighbor, like click on this link and I'll give you $3,000. Like there's a lot of um, 
incredulity to that statement, even though it's true for the child tax credit. And so one thing that we're studying now, um, and we've seen in a bunch of areas, is that actually being more formal or being um, uh, kind of less simple and clear might be the right strategy for government, even though that's clearly not the right strategy for like uh, a tech company um, that's like, you know, DoorDash puts like smiley faces at the end of their, of their messages. If the government tried to do that, no one would believe it was from the government. And so we're thinking through kind of how do you talk about money and free money um, to this population if you're the government? And uh, so far we think formality actually helps this conversation. Um, but your, the intervention that you suggest is a really good one. And I haven't seen any studies on that, but I think it's, that's a very uh, testable hypothesis that we could test. Great. Um, um, Anson Tong, um, how open to changes or experimentation are your local government partners usually? It, you know, in your experience so far, is but has there been an appetite for quote higher touch interventions beyond wording or messaging changes? Yeah, this is the this is the million dollar question. So here's here's my current thinking on this. Um, there are so many government agencies, departments, local governments, and the federal government. Um, that are on board with the idea of improving service delivery and are trying their best. And so we are not in a world that we were, you know, even five to 10 years ago in behavioral science where people think this is nonsense or people don't wanna put in the time or um, conversely, they think we can solve everything with a nudge. So I think there was, there was a period where either we thought we were gonna solve all the world's problems with a, you know, a, a zero cost tweak in the letter or people thought experimentation was too much of a hassle and they didn't want to get involved. We're kind of getting to a much more nuanced place. And, and there's people on this call like Brendan and others who are kind of leading that movement in local government um, to be thoughtful about what we can do with a nudge and a low light touch intervention and what we can't. But my experience has been that proving what is and isn't possible with a light touch nudge is often the first step to be able to have a nuanced conversation about higher touch intervention. So in the earned income tax credit space, we did a lot of work, you know, a million Californian six RCTs to show what we could and couldn't do with a light touch intervention. And that's now leading, and uh, the TLDR version is we can get people to engage, but we can't get them to file their taxes. Um, uh, the, that's led to conversations now that say, okay, like, well, maybe we need to invest in a hotline where you get like phone assistance uh, or proactive support by members of your community. I don't think that conversation um, would have as much meat if we didn't have this evidence on light touch interventions not being enough. And so I think those things go hand in hand, but I've been, I'm all the more pleasantly surprised to meet more people in government who are um, really serious about trying to figure out what you can do that's higher touch. And I think in the child tax credit, there's been a lot of experimentation, I use that term broadly, on much higher touch interventions like navigator models or door-to-door -door models where you know people are going you know census style going house to house and try to encourage people to, to participate um, and it's not clear that that's better right so if targeting is the main challenge it's super costly to go door by door to try to get people to take up programs um, mm -hmm. only to find that like one in a hundred are actually eligible and so there's, I think the conversation is moving to exactly where it should, which is what is the right ratio of high touch to low touch interventions and who does that work for and who does that um, not work for. Um, but we don't really have evidence that just going like full on high touch intervention is necessarily more effective, um, which leaves a lot of room for behavioral scientists like everybody on this call to be thoughtful about um, what outreach looks like. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Nicole Russo, um, shifting topic a little topics a little bit. Um, so you mentioned that one of the next steps of this work is addressing supply, um, and that's illustrated through the example of landlords not wanting to accept housing vouchers. Um, can you talk a little bit about where you think the research might point us next in terms of reducing stigma among those who are the gatekeepers of supply? Oh, I uh, love that question. Um, Nicole, the way I've structured the People Lab is to think about the people of government and then service delivery. And my dream projects are the projects that combine the two. So like, 
how do we think about investments in the government workforce that are gonna have outcomes on service delivery? And what you're pointing to is exactly at that intersection, which is how do we think about the beliefs and mindsets and um, ideas about deservingness that social workers and teachers and police officers and correctional officers have about the people that they're serving? And are there ways that improving or changing those beliefs and mindsets actually has an impact on who they serve? Because um, they're certainly like overworked and serving as many people as possible, but might change kind of who they give their extra hour of effort to. Um, so here's what I have no idea is the, is the, the true answer about how we're gonna do this, but we have some promising evidence from some work that I've been doing on burnout to suggest that if you manage to um, invest in the mental health of your workforce, you do see shifts in how they view the communities that they're serving. So we're doing some work now, uh, hasn't been published yet, I'm super excited about it, but don't tell people yet, um, that shows that you know reducing burnout in correctional officers changes how they view residents. So um, they use the language of inmates, so we can see kind of significant reductions in questions like inmates are violent or inmates um, uh, are dangerous or inmates don't share my values. So on all these questions that are not exactly stigma but are about perceptions of the community served, we see that kind of pulling the lever of supporting the, the frontline worker actually has these positive um, outcomes. Um, but this is very early stages um, of, of the work and, and this is how we're thinking about it. But I do think that all of behavioral science has to shift um, more towards nudging people in government, uh, people with more power to change their behavior, as opposed to just putting the onus of behavior change on those who are already um, uh, impacted by bad policy decisions or already kind of struggling uh, for other reasons. Great, thank you. Um, so we have one more question queued, um, but just uh, you know, a call to participants, we've got a little bit more time. So if you um, have any other burning questions or questions that you've been thinking, should I ask this, should I not, go ahead and drop them into the chat. We do have a little bit more time. Um, but like I said, we've got one more queue. This is from um, Brittany Moscato at Ideas42. Um, and she, says, I'd love to hear about your approach to designing the rental assistance postcard. Um, specifically, is there a reason why you took a text only approach and not use much or any imagery? Um, and then I will tack on to that, you know, is that partially because of what you discussed earlier around the approach that government needs to take when um, communicating with people in terms of more formality or not? <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And also, thank you for asking that question so politely. Uh, I've received a version of that question that was like, did you intentionally make the postcard so ugly or was that by accident? Uh, which is the same question. So here's, here's my answer and it has two parts. One is substantive. So exactly to, to Mitra, to your point, um, we now have a bunch of cases and most of these haven't been um, kind of published. So I think everyone's making the same mistake over and over again, but mm -hmm. um, that ugly government communication sometimes does better than kind of the pretty fancy image um, polished version. And then the question is why? So I have an argument that I'm trying, you know, I'm still, we're still theorizing this, um, that it's about source credibility and it's about, um, I'm going to call it ugliness for now in the paper, it's more fancy, but basically um, text, text heavy, um, but still clear in terms of language, right? So text heavy, um, kind of boring formatted stuff could be a mental heuristic for um, this is coming from the government and therefore I should take it seriously. As opposed to like, you know, we all in our, in our mail, we get a bunch of, you know, flashy flyers. We assume most of them are, are not real or like not, you know, coming from a company. So we kind of throw them out. Um, and now we're kind of really trying to study, is it, is it the fact that it's text only? Is it the fact that there's no images? Um, and it seems like it's a little bit additive. So a lot of those characteristics together add up to people perceiving something as more formal and perceiving something as more um, likely to come from government. Um, and what we have checked, which I think is an important part, is that formality and simplicity are different. 
So you can still have a low reading level, be really clear on your language and still have it um, perceived as uh, seriously from the government. Um, so all the research that has been done on complexity, I think still holds. Um, so that's one reason. The other reason is that, oh my goodness, firstly, we're really bad at designing things. Um, uh, so it's just a lack of talent. Um, and then, you know, when you have a city and three CBOs having to agree on a final format, like there were strong opinions by one of those players, which I won't shame on like, you can't use that font because that font has not been pre-approved or you can't use this color because that's not in our like comms strategy, whatever. So there's a lot of limitations on what you can actually send out if what you're sending out is coming from the government. Mm -hmm. oh, it looks like, can you guys all still hear me? Yep. Oh, you're cutting out a little bit now. Hmm. I think we may have lost audio. Can you oh, there you go. Oh, now. Mm -hmm. The Zoom is saying that it's failed to detect my microphone. It's 55 minutes oh. too late. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I'm just going to not touch anything. <laughs> well, well, for what it's worth, you're, you're back in terms of audio um, <laughs> with or without <laughs> Zoom's knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'm not sure where I, where I dropped off, but um, the short answer is basically some combination of theoretical reasoning and some combination of just the practice of sending out government communications and having lots of cooks in the kitchen <laughs> is why it, it looks like that. Absolutely. I think, I think many of us on the call can empathize certainly with the latter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, thank you. Um, last call for questions. We've got four minutes left in the hour. I don't see any more open ones. Um, and as Elizabeth had mentioned, um, she uh, would be happy to have people reach out directly. If you do think of something um, later on, um, you can reach her directly. Um, her email is elinos, L-I-N-O-S, at berkeley.edu. Um, and I believe we can also drop that into the chat. Um, Moises, if you don't mind um, putting that into the chat for everyone to see so they can just copy and paste it if they so choose. Um, and also just, uh, Reminder to everyone, thank you, um, that we will, we have been recording this session um, and we will be sending it out to everybody um, who joined and RSVP'd. Um, so please feel free to um, review this later on. And again, if you come up with questions after the fact, you can reach out um, directly to Elizabeth. I'll give it a few more seconds in case any lingering questions pop up and otherwise we can we can wrap up and, and get, give everyone a couple minutes back in their afternoons. See, we don't we don't have anything more, so I think we can we can close it there. And I'll just say, um, you know, thank you so much, um, Elizabeth, for your time and for sharing your insights, um, and for you know sharing even more insights coming out of all the the questions that were posed today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the great questions, and I and I do mean it. You should feel free to reach out if this or any kind of of the work that the People Lab does is interesting. I'm. Um, I'm excited to, to hear about your work um, as a kind of community as well. Absolutely. All right. Well, um, thank you everyone for joining. Um, as ever, final plug, you can find more information about Ideas 42's work and our Academy Seminar Series programming um, at ideas42.org slash academy. Um, and a final thank you, and we'll see you next time in the Ideas 42 Academy.